Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thing where I talk about things. Today, uh, I thought I would talk more about kind of the analysis thing, but in a broader sense, uh, I was a little surprised by exactly how many people uh, pitched in and, and got into arguments over the analysis thing in the last video. Uh, I thought that it was sort of a, a common opinion that the pony analysis stuff was a little bit silly and at times could be somewhat overbearing. Um, I mean, like, if you keep up with the writers of the show, and sometimes they react to this sort of stuff, you see that they tend to try to encourage people not to do this sort of thing that some of the analysts do. Uh, I can't remember who, I think it was uh, Amy Keating once pointed out that the game, uh, that the show is not Game of Thrones. Uh, you're never going to see My Little Pony develop these, these complex plot twists or family hierarchies or anything like that. You're not going to get into that really complex stuff. Uh, M.A. Larson did a video where he reviewed one of the episodes that he wrote. And he kept stopping to be like, see, I really like this part because it implies... And then he would say some sort of like really yutsy ass pole thing, like he would just make some crap up. And, and you know, it was like it was clear that, that M.A. Larson wasn't taking his own work quite as seriously as some of the pony reviewers were taking it. Uh, Kimmy Sparkle, too. Some people were like, they're like, oh, Kimmy Sparkle was great. And what's weird is even some of the reviewers really like Kimmy Sparkle. But the entire thing behind Kimmy Sparkle was just that she was making very Yahtzee, uh, kind of, like, she would make up reviews that were totally fictional. Like, she would review an episode, and she would say a bunch of things that didn't happen within the episode, like Discord and Twilight Fall in Love, or something like that. So, you know, it was, it was kind of weird. I just, I just looked at it and thought it was a totally non-controversial take to assume that analysis is kind of, um, when it takes itself seriously, it's really not for anyone's benefit. Um, some points were made, though, regarding the, the nature of criticism and analysis, and some of them were kind of interesting, but I think maybe if you were... that they have more merit kind of in, in different settings. And, uh, to be... To, the bottom line is, though, ultimately, uh, I was told a bit about how certain members of the of the analysis community regard Pila, and uh, and uh, in my words, they find it intellectually bankrupt. Um, they don't find it very funny at all. They, they, you know, they they, they think that th 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 basically the analysis thing. I just don't understand the analysis thing. But in any case, though, I thought that I would talk a little bit more kind of about criticism and analysis and what have you. Because my main thing with the pony analysis deal is not really that it exists. It's kind of like, a, it's, for me, it's like Let's Plays, you know? Like you watch a Let's Play and it's kind of more about the charisma of the person doing it or the anecdotes that they tell. Uh, some guys will do stuff and they'll talk about the way that the industry is headed, the gaming industry. They'll talk about development of the game. They'll show you how to do things. They might show off little secrets. There's a lot of different things that you might watch a Let's Play for. And there's different types of Let's Plays. Uh, what I do is more like role-playing Let's Plays. So you'll watch me play characters or I'll joke or, you know, mess up the story or whatever. But other people do different things. So the reviewers kind of work a little bit differently. Or the, the analysts kind of work a little bit differently. You could watch them for different things. Some of the guys will, uh, they will analyze the fabric in the show. And if you really want to know what kind of fabric is in the show based on conjecture from a guy who doesn't actually know a lot about fabric, then you can totally tune in and you can see this guy. Uh, they're all a little bit different and they're all a little bit weird. But the issue just that I take is that the, everything that they say that they do, they call it analysis. And I think that maybe this puts a lot of kind of like pomp on the whole thing. Like then it's just sort of like, it's like, oh, it's, this is a high-minded thing, you know? This is not a reaction video. This is not like a, you know, rambling diatribe about something that I saw. This is an analysis, you know? It's an analyzing. I'm analyzing this video and I'm finding all these conclusions and, you know, so on and so forth. And you know, whatever, is, is entertainment, that's fine, but but personally I just feel like it's it's just kind of, I don't know, self-aggrandizing to act like it's it's much more than just, you know, a reaction or a synopsis, or, or, or at best it's their reviews. Sometimes they're not even reviews, sometimes, most of the time they're just a synopsis with occasionally a little bit of commentary thrown in there. So more like reaction videos. But, uh, but I've always kind of had a little bit of issue with the concept of, of review and analysis where it comes to works of, of uh, entertainment. Uh, one, one big example is as I went through high school, this was kind of funny, as I spent a lot of time when I, when I was in high school I went through like the basic English classes. And then I got to my 
can't remember if it was junior or sophomore year, and I remember that I was given a poem, and they gave us two pens, and there was there was a green pen and a purple pen, and they said, take the green pen and highlight everything that you understand, and then have the purple pen highlight things you don't understand. And it was about this guy, he sees a duck, and the duck is flying south, and he says to himself, if God can, like, find direction for a duck, you know, if a duck just knows where to go, then surely a man can find his own way as well. So, like, I highlighted everything in green, except for, like, one part, because he used some kind of old English slang. I didn't know what that was. And, uh, and so that was it. And so my, one of my teachers came by. There was two teachers. I don't know how this wound up being. But there's two teachers in this class, and one of, them, one of them thought that I was just a waste of time. Because I was bored in class all the time, I would fall asleep, I wasn't taking the homework seriously, and so he thought that I was just a waste of time. The other teacher, however, came over, and she, she's like, she goes, Greg, uh, if you understand all that, tell me what it means. And I, goes, well, I go, well, this guy sees a duck, and he thinks the duck, da 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 And so she goes, uh, she goes uh, you don't belong in this class, I'm going to move you up to the AP class. So she moved me up into the AP class, and then I got to read a lot more classic literature, and uh, and I got to do a lot more reports on the classic literature, and so on and so forth. And that particular semester was actually a lot of fun for me, because what that teacher liked to focus on more was kind of about the era that stuff was written in, and the themes of the books, and things like that. And so it was sort of more educational towards how can you become a better writer? And how can you better understand the books as they're written? Because if you look into the eras that they're written, if you look into this, you know, like, is, this is the theme, this is what they're going for, then you can kind of understand a work better. Um, someone posted, there's, there's a couple different ways that you can do analysis. You can do analysis from the perspective of the writer. You can try to look at what the writer says and the way that they perceive things. And you can also do things, you can look at the general public and see what they're most consistently taking home from the writing. Or you can look at the text as a self-contained sort of thing. There's probably other ways that you can, you can analyze a work. Um, most people will kind of go for the way that the general public views things, though. Uh, but this can change though, as time goes on you find that cultural perceptions will change and so like one book might be written some time ago and you have uh, and you have them referring to like other races in ways that we would review as racist now and so the general public perception of this work is that it's a racist work you know it was a product of the times but when the author wrote it he really had nothing against you know whoever he was writing against you you might find for example like Captain Cook wrote a lot about his journeys uh, you know, as he traveled around the world. And, uh, and so ways that he would reference people, it wasn't really necessarily that he looked down on them, or maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It's hard to say, because uh, his perspective would have been different, and the people's perspective would have been different. He would have been writing for a different audience. So the way that we would regard uh, Captain Cook's writing about foreign nations, or foreign people, would change today compared to how it would have been back then. So, uh, you know, when you, when you analyze stuff, it all does kind of vary. There's a lot of subjectivity. But, but there's things that are kind of uh, less subjective, things that are a lot more mechanical. And so when I used to review books, that was kind of what I like to do, is I like to focus on the less subjective stuff and some of the more mechanical devices that are being used, like more of the metaphors and things like that. Writing is one of the easier things that people review these days because we all kind of know how to write and we all kind of know how to read. And so it's something that we can all sort of understand to a certain extent. Um, but when you, when you get really into the the depth of writing in the mechanical sense. Uh, grammar's a big deal, but grammar's always, like, grammar's really dry, and in a cartoon show you really aren't going to talk about the grammar very much because everything's in the form of written dialogue. Uh, what is more important tends to be the themes and the metaphors and the allegories and so on and so forth. How are they snagging your attention, introducing you to these characters, and getting you acclimated so they can hurly, they can, they can move you right along and get you invested in the plot? Uh, My Little Pony has done this where they've got their characters, you know, who, who all fit, you know, pretty strict stereotypes. And so you know pretty well who exactly they are right off the bat. You know, like Rarity is the dress horse, you know, uh, Rainbow Dash is the blue fast, and so on and so forth. You know who they are. They use some really well-established stereotypes. And you'll see that a lot of cartoons and a lot of shows do this. Uh, Steven Universe, I mean like this is what kills me, you see on Tumblr when people talk about things like Steven Universe breaking the mold and you've got these people writing reviews of Steven Universe and they're like, you know, I'm so glad to see finally we've got these, these, you know, lesbians and whatever, but, but if you actually look at Steven Universe, they're really not breaking molds, what they're doing is they're using molds and they're using them effectively, it's good writing. 
you know they take the stereotypes you recognize the stereotype and they use it to to kind of establish the character for you quickly so they can get along and they can tell the story um, in fact on that note I mean like a, a, on the latest Banana Republic I had some people criticize they said you know I'm not really feeling these characters right now um, it's something I'm gonna have to think about going forward because the trouble is that I've been doing the let's plays and I've been thinking about these characters for ages and I spend all this time working on the animation I forget that the audience needs to be introduced to all this stuff because they haven't spent hours uh, dealing with it you know like I have from my pers production perspective um, and this is one of the things like as somebody who actually makes stuff who makes content uh, it's very easy to forget that your audience needs to be introduced, that you need to use tropes, and that you need to use metaphors and allegories and things that people can pick up on and move with. Um, but anyway, though, within writing, I found that, that different teachers would take different approaches to analyzing literature and things like that, where you would get, like, a, like my first teacher was kind of more focused on the era and what the people were doing you know what it kind of meant some of the allegories and how they were used and my second teacher was more I don't know what to say she kinda had decided what things meant and she didn't really want to get into the mechanical stuff in fact she once criticized my papers for being too focused on on the more mechanical aspects of writing um, she used to give me uh, B's consistently and everything B's and C's consistently on everything and then I had one one classmate who would just regurgitate exactly what this teacher had to say about the subjective nature of every book. I hated this. This just my teacher just had this subjective like this she wanted to focus on these subjective ideals, but she really just wanted everyone to agree with her own subjective ideals. So she would give this student an A because what this student would do is she would write reports and she would just repeat what the teacher had said about the book. And this was terrible because you actually didn't have to read the book to be able to write a good report for this teacher. You just had to pay attention to what the teacher was saying about the book. Uh, and so I kind of did poorly in that class because a lot of times I would think that the subjective stuff is a lot more fluid because what you put into a book, and actually this is where you, uh, I will not talk about that, but what, um, what you get out of a book depends a lot on yourself and where you're coming from. I mean, like, the author puts some of themselves in the book, and they try to guide your perspective using all these different conventions. But if you, the reader, have some conven- like, if you have a different experience, a different life experience, you might get a somewhat different message out of the book. And so you'll be reading a completely different book. And of course, everyone reads with slightly different inflections in the characters, they might read with different accents, you know, they, they just kind of put themselves into the book and what they get out is some of the author and some of themselves so everything is subjective works of fiction are somewhat amorphous and even and even works in real life you find if you analyze like things in real life and you say well I think this person did that and I think this person did this you get you get different perspectives depending on where you come from now, like for example I mentioned the digibrony and the Fulcon thing and I got some people who just really wanted to defend Digibrony, and then some people who came in to defend Fulcon. And uh, and ultimately, I really, like, it really didn't matter. Like, I really didn't care. I was using it as an example of something that the analyst community does, because they do a lot of things that you really would discourage on a professional level. I mean, it's not, like, it wasn't just the Fulcon thing. It was just that that was the biggest, like, most, like, you know, sore thumb thing that I could think of as an example. But they do a lot of very non-professional things, things that you would strongly discourage. And that's what I was getting at. That was that was uh, my take on it. And then I got a bunch of people who came in and they were like, oh, you know, like, he didn't actually do that. And then other people were like, well, he was right to defend Fulcon. And then some, you know, it's free speech. And I was like, I don't, I don't really care about that. That, you know, I don't really want to talk about that topic. I don't want to get pulled down into that. Um, to be honest, I don't even really want to get pulled down into the pony analysis thing with much depth. I don't want to get involved in anything that, that has to do with a ton of drama and a ton of uh, just overthinking a kid's show. Like, it just, it just sounds like a really quick way to ruin the fandom for myself and to make me hate everything about it. It just, it just feels, to me, it just feels icky and toxic. Like, I just don't, I don't want to get, I don't want to get sucked into it too much. I mean, like, I'll make fun of the show, I'll analyze the show, I'll look at the things used in the show. Um, but, but I acknowledge that, like I say, fundamentally, the things that I do and say 
it's all, all the subjective stuff is kind of amorphous and everybody kind of has their own different perspectives. Um, whether or not they're using the tools effectively, most of the times they are. Um, sometimes the episodes are a little bit clunky or it seems like they're not really hitting a mark, but you know, what can I say? It's just, it's just one of many shows on the, on the television and not every single one is going to fly well and they're different writers and they're all kind of trying to tell a story based on a single universe with their own varying perspectives of this universe. So, I don't know. It's, it's strange. Uh, I mean, like, one that you could argue about is, like, how Spike, like, Spike has got a stereotype. And this is why everyone says, like, it's really frustrating to watch Spike episodes, because you see Spike has the stereotype, as he's, like, the, the servant, you know, he takes care of everything, he can clean, he can cook, he can do all this stuff. He's good at that, and nothing else. And then they have an episode where he's supposed to be cleaning and cooking and taking care of these things, and he sucks at it. And so it kind of obliterates, like you've got the stereotype as the servant, and then they have a, an episode where they focus on Spike, and they're trying to use a completely different stereotype as the, uh, they, they make him the klutzy screw-up. And suddenly, like, that's a totally different stereotype than the one that they normally use for him. Because Spike is normally a background character, so they just, they just use the, you know, he's the servant, or he's Twilight's foil, or whatever. And so they kind of they kind of do that where they, they switch up the stereotype, and that's a really bad idea mechanically speaking. And so that's where you get why people don't like Spike probably. Um, you can also look at the theme surrounding the show. Uh, I've talked about this before, where if you look at when My Little Pony came out, it came out uh, during a recession, and the people who really like the show happen to be millennials. And the millennials, of course, were among the hardest hit group by the recession. We had uh, we have and had much higher unemployment. Uh, lower wages, kind of like at that stage in life where you don't really know where you're gonna go. And of course, what do the ponies have? They live in this idyllic little society, you know, it's very small, it's not riddled with bureaucracy, all their talents are marked on their butts so they know exactly what they're supposed to be doing in life. Why would that not appeal to millennials? I, I think that's a big portion of why the show got popular, among everything else. Um, so there's a lot of things, like I say, there's, there's ways that you could look at the show, but I focus too much on the show. What I was working towards was a story about when I got into college English. And I remember by this point I developed a much better idea of how I kind of approach literature and things like that. And I had to read a book about, about this guy, and he had a half-brother named James. And, and the author stressed that James had a different perspective on life and that a lot of people didn't respect it and a lot of people didn't listen to it. And at the end of the book, James gets framed for murder and he gets thrown in prison and no one really listens to his testimony because they, they all think that he is a murderer and so they just kind of ignore his testimony. So when I did my report on the book, and this is actually kind of funny, someone pointed out that analysis to them is just like a book report. When I did my analysis on that book, um, I talked about actually uh, James and Christianity. James's brother. Uh, Jesus had a brother, James, half brother, James. And so I drew some parallels between James and the James in the book. You know, they had the same name and there were some similarities that you could draw. And of course, a lot of authors like to rely on the Bible for, for allegory or for reference or things like that. And so I went through and I made kind of a compelling argument in favor of James being a direct parallel to James in the Bible. Because you find that, that James in the Bible, uh, he and Paul did not get along. They were people much at odds with each other. For example, I think that James didn't believe that Christ was actually God. He believed that he was one of God's children, of course, and a prophet of God. He spoke, you know, God's word. But, uh, but as far as I've read, James didn't actually believe in the divinity of Christ. Paul did. And eventually Paul went out. Paul's, Paul's views are what became canon, and Paul believed that Jesus was God. So you found that, you know, James, what James really believed about Jesus and what James uh, followed regarding Jesus kind of didn't, it wasn't kept. I mean, like, kind of people kind of threw him out, and his perspective on the faith sort of was defeated. So I drew these parallels, and I talked about this thing, and that was like the first half of my report. And the second half of the report was me basically defeating my entire analysis where I was going on and I was like, you know, but ultimately, uh, probably this isn't true. And I kind of went into a few reason, reasons why. And it was a little bit odd because my professor scolded me for, for picking apart my own analysis. Because she went on, she was like, no, no, it's a good analysis. Like, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have tried to defeat it. Like, you're, you're turning around and kind of like biting yourself over, you know, how unlikely it is that he was trying to make these connections. 
And of course, you know, you only get to write the one report. You don't get to write a rebuttal to your teacher's rebuttal or anything like that. The teacher gets the last word. She's, you know, she's the teacher, of course. But the thing that bugged me about this is I, I wrote this book report. And when you look at something and you draw this conclusion, and you, you know, you have some parallels between James and the Bible and James, this character. Uh, although you might be able to make a compelling argument and link these two things together, if you look at it from a purely mechanical perspective, there's probably not really that many people who are familiar with this historical perspective of James as being the half-brother to Jesus who got ultimately snubbed by Paul. Uh, in fact, this perspective of biblical history is somewhat controversial. I don't believe that everyone would agree that this was necessarily the case. I've just read that there are historians that, that you know, say this is how it played out. So there's a lot of ways that you could actually deconstruct that whole thing. And this is the trouble with kind of trying to read a whole lot into a literature, in, into a work of literature, from more the subjective stance, from trying to reach in and pull out stuff that may or may not be there. Because even if you could kind of, you could, you could gather that, I mean, if you have that perspective, if you knew that history and you believed in it, and then you read a book and you thought that it lined up with your experiences, you could pull that out of a book. And, and I mean, I guess it's kind of an interesting perspective, but, but ultimately, even though you can do that, most people wouldn't be able to. And, and uh, to be honest, I kind of dislike when authors use Christ and the Bible to write their own books, when they try to compare their characters to Jesus or things like that, because Jesus is like an ideal. Uh, I mean, among other things, like he's, he's supposed to be like the ideal of what a human can be. You know, you want to be as you, like they ask yourself, like, what would Jesus do? And of course, Jesus would do the right thing. And so when a person takes a, a character in a book, and they're like, my character is basically Jesus, you know, or my character is an allegory for Jesus. It's sort of like, you know, why? Because he was martyred? Or because his name is like Joe Christmas? Or whatever, you know, it's just, it's sort of, um, it's sort of like a, almost, like I said, it's just self-flagellating. It's something that the author, author does that I feel like they probably really shouldn't do, unless they're using it to kind of uh, get, get the reader to understand the character better. Again, it comes back to stereotypes and whatnot. If you're setting something up to make the reading easier, then it makes sense in a mechanical way. But if you're using it, if you're, if you're hiding these allegories just for the sake of hiding allegories, then basically, you're just jacking off. Like, there's really no point in it. It's kind of stupid. It probably detracts from the reading and makes it a little bit muddier because then you have this weird nonsense that, that doesn't... I mean, like, English professors are going to love you for it, like, English teachers are going to love you for it, students are probably going to find it easy, like, it'll be easier to write about stuff, because, oh, you know, hey, you know, Joe Christmas, that's like Jesus Christ, and, and, oh, James, you know, that was, that was the brother of Jesus in the Bible, and, you know, it's good for book reports, but, but to be honest, it's kind of crap for writing. It can be. I mean, there's not a universal rule. But this is just kind of always how I've been with things like book reports and whatnot. Because cause writing is a form of communicating. So, I mean, like, imagine you were talking to somebody, and instead of being straight with you, every time they talked to you, they were making, like, bizarre references to things that you didn't know about. I mean, like, how obnoxious would that be? Wouldn't you eventually just want to punch that guy in the face? And so, I think the same thing happens with writing, where you get books, and if they're just making, like, allusions to things that they think that people won't understand, and then they kind of, like, hold that over you, you know, that kind of sucks. A lot of old books uh, reference the Bible, though, because many people, everyone's familiar with the Bible. This is why you see that so often, is because everyone's familiar with the Bible. So if you make a reference to the Bible, then people kind of follow along, and they go, oh, okay, like Jesus, you know, they, they know what you're going for. But if you're doing this in, like, a more modern book and you're just trying to make these really hidden allusions to, to things and you're wasting everyone's time. So I don't know. I feel like I feel like overanalyzing a book or any kind of work to try and draw more out of it than what's really there. I mean it's it can be kind of fun because it's kind of neat and like maybe you might learn a little bit of history from something like that. Because that was the ultimate thing, is I feel like maybe if this author wasn't really trying to draw a parallel between this historical perspective of James, uh, I mean, like, at least talking about it, people who had read my report would maybe have learned a little bit about this history, and you could say, like, yeah, it's probably there. But ultimately, though, um, 
if that's what he was doing for that particular book, it was kind of a waste of time if he was doing it. It was it was a poor literary, it was poor use of literary technique. It would have just been whacking off like this guy just you know big head jackass uh, kind of thing. Because no one would have picked up on it, and the people who knew about it might have looked at it and they said, well, that's, you know, that's not really like, not everybody agrees on the historical perspective. Not everyone agrees on that perspective. Um, yeah. But anyway, though, as far as, as far as like cartoons and things, though, you find that a lot of cartoons are not really all that well designed uh, to, to search for allegory and hidden meaning. I mean, you can sort of you know, spitball over what's going to happen in a show. Like I mentioned Steven Universe previously, where they people talk about, oh, these characters are breaking molds, when in reality they're just using molds very well. Um, you could say, like, well, where do I think the show is going to go? I mean, I've got, like, some theories on where the show is going to go. But ultimately, I don't think there's, there's too much that you can read into things outside of... There's, I mean, like, there's a couple little hints. Like, you can sort of look at it, and you can say, like, Onion's mom probably screwed around with... Uh, Greg's manager, and uh, and so Onion is like a or, or, or whatever that guy's name, cream cream cheese or something like that. I can't remember. Whatever the older one is, that's that's the like the half you know half brother to Onion. You know stuff like that is in there, but beyond those kinds of things, those little those little uh, background details dropped by the author, you don't get into that really like in depth you know, allegorical, metaphorical stuff, you get into some of the more technical aspects of writing, like what stereotypes are we using for Rose? Uh, like, you know, she's the mother. What stereotypes are you using for Pearl? You know, and she's like, the, she's the nerd, she's the neat freak, she's the nerd. And then you can kind of look at the character designs and how the characters are designed to sort of follow the stereotypes. So like Rose is very, she's very thin and she has very good posture and, uh, you know, she's got like a big nose, you know, and, and you know, these, these all kind of fit what you might use as a... These, these kind of fit a stereotype for the very uptight, you know, nerdy character. And of course then you've got Amethyst and she's the little slob. She's like small and she's kind of heavier and like her, you know, her, her pant leg is torn up. You know, they're using a stereotype and then they're designing the character after the stereotype. And so there's plenty of mechanical stuff you can analyze about the show. Ways that they're doing things right. Ways that they're making the characters easily identifiable. You know, the silhouettes are good, it's it's a good show, It's so far it's looking really good. Um, but it's not like artsy-fartsy. It's not the kind of thing where, just like My Little Pony, I wouldn't do an analysis, uh, like, I wouldn't sit down and try to analyze the minutia of each and every episode of, of Steven Universe. You might analyze some of the overarching themes or kind of look at like a whole, you know, season by season and kind of, you know, look at how they set up and hinted at various things. And that could be sort of interesting. But episode by episode, it would be kind of frivolous. I mean, like the only thing you could do is read more than what was there. And, you know, you're just, you're just kind of whacking off. So, um, but, but there are shows though that you could actually look at and have each and every one each and every episode kind of deserves some serious analysis. Uh, one that I was talking about a friend with was Over the Garden Wall. Uh, this is what I was talking about. It's like, I don't really get the analysis thing. I don't get why you would do episode by episode analysis of, of My Little Pony and act like it was a high-minded thing. But like, if you look at a show like Over the Garden Wall, which is much more artsy-fartsy, uh, that's, that's actually got a lot of hidden symbolism in it. If you haven't seen that show, I really recommend it. Over the Garden Wall is very charming at its face value, but if you really want to kind of pick it apart and look at it, what it does is it actually subverts a lot of tropes and a lot of expectations. What it'll do is it'll kind of set you up and to expect certain things, and then it just turns around and does other things until you get used to that just being the show. Everything in the show is a subversion. So like, for example, they have one episode where they stumble into this cult, and the cult uh, makes the two kids go out and dig graves. And, uh, and the kids assume that they're going to be killed, but it turns out that, you know, it was for a positive thing, actually. They weren't really, they weren't digging their own graves, they were digging graves, they were digging other people's graves, you know, for a positive reason, if you can believe that. Um, but the show kind of, like I say, everything good, not everything good, but a lot of good things turn around to be bad things, and a lot of bad things turn around to be good things. You know, the light in the forest, for example, is, is, is a terrible thing, whereas you know, uh, a, a city full of, you know, a city full of cultists actually winds up being a really good thing. 
everybody's happy. Another good example I like is from that show, is where you run into this school that this lady is trying to teach, and her father comes in and he, he takes away all the instruments, and he's really mad, and you know, he's like, you know, we can't afford to waste money. And the impression they give is that he's this really tight-fisted, miserly Scrooge. But then you find out that what it is is that he spent every penny he had on keeping the school open so his daughter could continue to live out her dream of teaching at the school. And the reason he takes the instruments is because he's going to sell them to make more money so that he can keep the school open. So, you know, like I say, you subvert expectations. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, allegorical stuff in there. There's a lot of um, common tropes that you see that they turn upside down. And so it's kind of charming in that way because, it, you know, you can look at what trope are they using and how do they turn the trope around and what's the overall theme. I still kind of itch my brain over the fact that when they end that series, they do so with the uh, with this theme song, and the last the last line of that song is uh, it's a beautiful lie, or something like that. And uh, and I just kind of think about that being like a theme for the show, like everything is a lie. So the show had an overarching theme, and episode by episode they explored different components of that theme. There were different things. So I think that would be the sort of show that you really could sit down and you could analyze and you could pick apart, like, what were they trying to say? Uh, what were some of the ways that they turned things over? And, and you could speculate a lot on, like, at the end, everything kind of works out for the kids. But it's all kind of a beautiful lie, isn't it? I mean, it's a work of fiction, and all works of fiction are lies, in a sense. Um, but they're rather beautiful lies, so we forgive them if they're told well, works of fiction. Uh, you know, so there's there's a lot that you could look into, and there's a number of theories that you could make. And there's a lot there to actually kind of dig into. Another one that's good, and this one is much more lighthearted, is Gravity Falls. Uh, Gravity Falls, actually, M.A. Larson uh, did some writing for Gravity Falls. He actually wrote Double Dipper. Um, but Gravity Falls, you can see that that one's more fun in that there's not as much uh, artsy-fartsy stuff to analyze in that one. What there is is there's a lot of conspiratorial stuff that's, that's in there that they add intentionally because the entire show is about conspiracy and things being hidden, you know? Like you need the black light to read the book correctly and so on and so forth. And uh, if you listen at the end of the episodes, I think, or at the end of the theme songs, there's like words written backwards. And so there's actually people who sit down and they analyze this stuff and they try to predict where exactly the author is going. And in this case, the author is intentionally trying to get you to do that. So there's all kinds of little hints and little things, and you'll see characters in the background, and this and that, that hints that there's more going on behind the plot. The whole show is themed to be like this. And so that would be another one that would deserve episode-by-episode episode analysis, because there's stuff legitimately and intentionally hidden in every single episode that would require you to scrutinize each and every episode and pull stuff out of it. And have you know there's there's a lot going on there's a lot to look at and so that kind of stuff uh, again is fun I'm not really hard on the thing that the whole analysis thing in general like I say to me it's like let's plays uh, you know or, or reaction videos or what have you it may be entertaining I mean the person who's doing it you know might be charismatic and that might be why you watch it um, but I was warned when I did peel off that that most analysts would take it deeply personally and that they wouldn't find it funny and uh, and that they just they just take themselves really seriously and that there were precious few analysts who would be able to take the joke and as it turned out what i'm being told the general consensus uh, well just just some analysts i'm being told some analysts uh, really don't think it's funny they they really don't like to be poked fun at and i think it's because they view what they're doing is very intellectual. But for my part, personally, I think that pony analysis, uh, it's very easy. There's, it's very easy to get into, which is why there are so many people doing it, uh, which is why it's so full of drama, which is one reason why I don't really want to get into it too much myself. Uh, the reason the way I do it with Pilaf, I mean, I might, I'll continue to work with Pilaf as I'm struck by inspiration. But what I can do with Pilaf, though, is I can actually draw, and I can, I can practice my artwork, and I can practice my animation, and, uh, and have fun at the same time. Like, analyzing the episode with all the guildas in it was fun. Like, replacing Pinkie Pie with Sam Brownback, and then having Sam Brownback do some of the things that Pinkie Pie did, was actually pretty hilarious to me. Like, I was... You can ask the people who join us in the stream, I was cracking up a little bit during that whole process. Like, like just the whole, just the stupid thing, like Sam Brownback then throw himself off the cliff. And then I kind of laughed to myself because 
It amuses me to think of Sam Brownback as Pinkie Pie. Blue Regard Cute Kazoo, replacing Rainbow Dash. It's all just kind of like very silly, but it's more of a more of a blunt force trauma approach to the whole thing. And it summarized the episode in like, you know, four, three or four minutes as opposed to being a whole 20 minute long. That's the thing that kills me. I can't believe that they can make like 15, 20 minute episodes about My Little Pony. Like, how do you have a synopsis be that long about the My Little Pony show? <sighs> but, but anyway though, um, like I say, ultimately I'm not really trying to affect a lot of change. Uh, the reason I posted the, the last video, the last uh, personal time video about this was just because there were people who were concerned that I was trying to obliterate the analysis fandom or really trying to be very scathing. And, uh, and I'm not really that emotionally invested in it, I just think it's silly. And, uh, and I'm not really like judging people who enjoy it, I just think it's silly. Like that's, that's the bottom line, is, uh, is I'm not like... I, I don't uh, look down on anyone who enjoys it. If you guys enjoy it, then like I say, it's the same as it's the same as like enjoying Let's Plays. You find those guys charismatic, or you kind of like some of their perspectives or the silly things that they say. Uh, one of those guys, maybe if he hates Angel and you hate Angel, you like it when he talks about how much he hates Angel. Uh, as humans, we we like to hear opinions similar to our own. So if you have similar opinions to, to the analyst, then that's also an appeal. There's a broad number of reasons why certain people might get into the analysis thing. Um, but, I don't know, for me, it's never been... In spite of what may seem like a lot of over-analysis, it's never really been... serious for me. I mean, how can I say... Kenza had to quit watching Free with me, for example. Because Kenza really likes Free. I think, she maybe won't admit this, but I think it's because it's about naked boys in swimming pools. That's what I think. That's that's why I think Kenza likes Free. That's A lot of girls apparently like Free for that reason. Um, but when I watched the show, I kept making fun of it. And I wasn't disliking the show, but I just kept joking about all these little things that the guys were doing. And so Kenza quit watching Free with me. Because she didn't want me to ruin the show. And But but I had to just tell her, I was like, you know, it's the way I enjoy a lot of entertainment. I, I just kind of like to make fun of these things. And, 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 you know, I don't know. My Little Pony is kind of the same way. When I watch My Little Pony with friends, uh, a lot of times we laugh and we joke. And, you know, for me, they're all, they're horses. And so when they do things that are dumb or inconsistent, for me, it's because they're horses. And I just kind of laugh. And I'm like, ah, they're horses. They're pretty horses. Ah. And, you know, and I have a good time. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of more, in the actual production stuff, there's all kinds of interesting things that go into that. But, but uh, ultimately though, like I say, I, w I don't really want to be pulled down into the drama of it. I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to get too high-minded about the whole thing. Because at that point, I mean, if you, if you stake your own self worth on whether or not you can analyze a kid show, you eventually, I mean so many of those guys, you just see them become deeply unhappy. And I think it's because they, they eventually realize that they're kind of trapped by the whole thing. Like they do their analysis, I mean that was Digibrony's whole thing. When he left the fandom, he was just like, I hate everyone, I hate all of you. And he's not the only one who's done this. Uh, you know, they're just sort of like, I hate this, I hate you, I hate it, I'm cutting ties, I'm leaving. And then they go off and they do something else, and it's never as big as Pony, because, you know, Pony is just big. It's, people like Pony. And, uh, and like I say, I, I don't... People have asked me how I stay interested in this show, and it's just that I have fun with it, and I don't overthink it. You know, I, like, I, I laugh at it. You know, they're all horses. But, uh, but the way I think to continue to enjoy the show best, at least, at least if you're like me, is to just not take it that seriously. Just enjoy. It's colorful. The animators are doing a good job. You know, the writers are working. M.A. Larson's stuff, sometimes when I see the things that he posts or the things that he says, guy kind of cracks me up. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a show. You know, it's a cartoon. It's entertainment. Be entertained. Like, just have fun. And I guess if the analysis thing is fun for you, then, uh, then all this is nothing but hot air. Uh, but that's fine as well. Like I say, I'm not trying to really change minds. Uh, it's, it's, it's personal time with Greg. This is my personal opinion. Um, like I said, I was a little shocked. I was a little shocked by how much con how controversial it was to say that the pony analysis is is goofy. Um, 
Even more interesting, I, I have received notification from YouTube that that video received more commentary from Canadians than any other video that I've posted in six months. Somehow, I have really snagged Canada's attention with by talking about pony analysis. I don't know. I don't know why Canada is so big on pony. This is sort of an interesting, really an interesting demographic thing. Like, I, I get those every now and then for a little while. For like a couple of months, for some reason, YouTube was also reporting that like women in their 40s were one of my top demographics. They, that actually, that quit being the case later on, but for a little while, that was, it was what it was showing. I was just like, huh, what am I doing to attract 40-year-old women to my show? I, I don't know, weird, weird. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I speculated like maybe mom? No, no, I, don't, I wasn't sure. It probably was something wonky in this system, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe for some reason the YouTube algorithm was showing my, my shows. Because the algorithm makes a big difference on whether or not your stuff gets posted. So maybe the YouTube, al YouTube algorithm was showing my shows to women in their 40s. So they're like, women in their 40s will love this. And then they watch it and, and YouTube was like, yes, we did good. No, wait, maybe we didn't do good. And then they quit doing that. And so women in their 40s quit watching as often. I, I don't know. We still have women in their 40s that watch it. According to the demographic data, it's just it's just that for a while they were my core audience, and I did. I don't know why that was my core demographic. <laughs> according according to the analytic, um, yeah. But yeah. But anyway, though, um, that's my thoughts on it. Uh, you may agree or disagree. But uh, but yes. But I felt compelled to follow up just because I was shocked by how many people uh, disagreed with me. As people have pointed out, I have tyranny over the mic. This is the thing, is that when I say stuff, and I'm just kind of like rattling off my opinions for 40 minutes on uh, on what it is I think and what it is, it's, it's all just me, and it's all kind of just like what's in my head at the moment, however articulate that may be. Uh... You know, and I don't have anyone else there to disagree or, or to say things. Uh, like I said, I, uh, there are fans that have followed for a good while who really like my stuff, um, who disagreed, and they put forth, you know, their, their compelling arguments and, you know, I, I, I don't know. But, that, you know, there we go. I, I, have, I have the mic. I don't, mind, I don't mind you guys disagreeing, but, yeah. This is why this is why I started doing the let's plays with three characters and then tried to give them differing opinions so that everybody I could get different perspectives on things. But with personal time with Greg, it is just Greg, so you know I just say what I think and then and then you know, uh, eh. So I don't know. That's just what I think. I just think the analysis thing is silly. I think, I think, uh, and it's not just pony analysis. I think many different forms of analysis uh, get too full of themselves. I, I like. I mean, I'm, I, I'm critical of this in, like, for example, communications. Like, I remember reading a. I had to read a book as an assignment from a communication professor about politeness, and this communications professor had tried to build this entire model, this entire social model around politeness, and it was so overblown. And I just couldn't help but think that this was a person who had staked their entire lives, their future, everything on their ability to analyze human communications. And so they, they wrote a book on, uh, on, like, on politeness because that was their profession and they had to do it. You know, it just, it was like, that was, they staked their life on this thing. Um, so it's not just pony. I mean, you see this in a lot of different mediums, but it's just that pony, like I make fun of ponies, so. I could make fun of communications as well, I suppose, professors and, and things like that. Uh, but I haven't done anything yet that would really mock the uh, that would mock that particular aspect of society. So I don't know. I, I think it's silly. I think it's always it's always good to be able to laugh at yourself and to be able to realize that we are just primates and uh, clever primates. We're very clever, but also quite dumb much of the time. So I don't know. That's all. Uh, thanks for joining me, everybody. I'll catch you all next time.